Welcome to Columbia Neurosurgery's Facebook Live event interview with Dr. Peter Angevine. Dr. Angevine, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your practice? Sure. Uh, I'm a, a neurosurgeon by residency training here at uh, Columbia University. Uh, I work here and at the Spine Hospital. My, within neurosurgery, we here at Columbia specialize, and so I only perform spinal surgery. Uh, and within spinal surgery, I perform mostly uh, spinal deformity surgery uh, in adults and in, uh, in kids. We're here today to talk about scoliosis and your expertise and understanding of that area and the procedures you do. Can we start with you letting us know what is scoliosis? Sure. So scoliosis refers strictly to a sideways bend of the spine. So traditionally, uh, besides the clinical examination, the way that the spine was studied was with x-rays, which are flat pictures of the bones of the body. Uh, one x-ray is generally taken from the, from the front or the back of the body and the other from the side. And if you look at the spine of somebody with scoliosis on that front back x-ray called an AP x-ray, the spine has a curve to the side, which it normally does not have or only has a very small curve. So a scoliosis, technically speaking, is a sideways bend of the curve, although the deformity itself is a little more complicated than that, as, as I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later. Are there different types of scoliosis? Can you give us an overview on that? Sure. So we think about scoliosis being divided in a couple of different ways. Uh, the simplest is by the age of the person with the scoliosis. So we talk about infantile scoliosis in the very young, juvenile scoliosis in those uh, up to about 10 years of age or so. The most common scoliosis, which I'm, I, I think my partner, Dr. Anderson, is going to talk about later in the week is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, which is in the adolescent population. Uh, and then what we're really focusing on today is the adult scoliosis. Uh, so we divide scoliosis first by age. Uh, another way to, to think about scoliosis and that we talk about scoliosis is by its cause. So adolescent idiopathic scoliosis doesn't have an identifiable cause. It occurs for, for reasons that we don't yet understand, although we're, we're starting to. Uh, in the adult group, um, most patients who have scoliosis never had scoliosis when they were younger. They developed it later, and it's because of the way their spine has, has weathered the age and the changes that go along with age, so it's a degenerative scoliosis. So how is scoliosis diagnosed? So there are a couple of uh, different ways that it can be diagnosed. Ultimately, um, we don't say that somebody has scoliosis unless we see an x-ray. Um, uh, the AP x-ray that I talked about earlier, uh, see an x-ray where the spine is curved 20 degrees or more. So that's the technical way that we diagnose scoliosis. Um, sometimes there are clinical uh, manifestations of the scoliosis. So uh, an adult may notice that one shoulder is higher than another where they used to be level. Uh, sometimes people notice a change in in their waistline, a shifting of the body to one side, and that might lead to uh, getting a CT or an MRI, on which we can also see scoliosis if we look carefully. Are there other symptoms of scoliosis other than seeing the deformities? So again, in the the adults are different than than in. Um, in uh, children, children and adolescents tend not to have any pain associated with, with scoliosis. But in the adult population, the population that I spend a lot of time working with, um, pain can be a symptom of scoliosis. Um, certainly by the time patients come to see me, they usually have some degree of pain. And part of my job is, is to try to determine if the symptoms are related to the scoliosis or are they simply symptoms of, of another process and unrelated to the scoliosis. Well, we have somebody who wrote in, Amanda, and asked if Chiari is related to scoliosis. That's a great, a great question and a, a somewhat complicated one, probably best uh, for Dr. Anderson. Uh, I think on Thursday uh, of this week, he's doing a similar uh, discussion because there is an association with Chiari uh, and with tethered cord, and these are generally um, 
diagnoses that are made in, in the younger patient population um, and the treatment of patients who have Chiari and scoliosis is very specific um, to the individual patient and to the age of the, of the patient. But they can be related, yes, although that's, that's a small proportion of patients overall who have scoliosis. Can anything be done to prevent scoliosis, lifestyle modifications um, to prevent from worsening as well? So we think in, again, in the adult uh, population, when, we, when, we, when I first meet patients who have scoliosis who maybe have some mild or minimal symptoms related to their curve, um, we talk about good spine health and good spine practices. And for a patient with scoliosis uh, in adulthood who may or may not have some degree of back pain that comes and goes and possibly even some leg pain, some sciatica or, or radiculopathy, which is the technical term for that. We talk about good habits for maintaining core strength um, uh, with an abdominal routine. We talk about low impact aerobic exercise, uh, weight optimization. So uh, carrying a lot of extra weight around uh, puts more stress on the spine and that potentially can lead to uh, progression of the scoliosis. But really for a patient with or without scoliosis, um, for the vast majority of patients, we just encourage an active, active healthy lifestyle. Um, can anything, um, as, if someone has been diagnosed with scoliosis, can they safely continue their normal activities, whether it's yoga or something you know, more active golf? Right, that's a great question and one that uh, generally comes up toward the end of visits for some reason with, uh, with patients. Um, you know, what is it safe for somebody with scoliosis to do or what, what activities should be avoided? And the simple answer there is that, especially for an individual patient, we, we don't have the evidence that any one activity is, is particularly beneficial or harmful. Uh, for for a patient in the absence of symptoms, and so generally, what I counsel is is common sense. If if something causes significant discomfort, if it doesn't feel right, however however that means, then generally that's an indication that that might be a, a an activity or a position or or maybe just a yoga move best left alone. Uh, on the other hand, for many people. They find that while they're doing a particular activity, golf is a common uh, uh, one that I get asked about, jogging is another. Uh, they say, well, while I'm doing that activity, I feel good, but later or maybe the next day, I, I feel sore, I feel uncomfortable. And in the absence of any neurological signs or symptoms like numbness or weakness or any of the red flags, generally what we talk about is, is risk benefit. If, if the benefit and the enjoyment uh, from that activity outweighs the, the temporary discomfort, you know, from, from that follows, it's certainly safe in the vast majority of cases for patients to do whatever they feel comfortable doing. Well, then at what point should somebody consider seeking treatment? Well, certainly any, any significant change, um, you know, in terms of symptoms, in terms of body position, posture, um, but really what brings patients in to see me uh, in general is, is pain, discomfort, um, and that can take a, a few different forms in the adult with scoliosis. Um, leg pain, sciatica, uh, which is technically a, a pinched nerve root in the spine, um, that is probably the most common, most severe symptom that patients come in. Uh, to uh, to have evaluated, so so constant shooting leg pain, electrical pain, or any any neurological symptoms, numbness, tingling that that are aren't, aren't momentary that that come and stay, and certainly if they progress, those are those are symptoms that that should be evaluated. Um, back pain is is a little more difficult. Back pain is so common, um, the vast majority of of people have back pain and a back pain episode at some point actually annually, more than half of Americans will have some episode of back pain. But, but again, lingering back pain, more severe back pain, back pain that keeps people home from work, those kinds of symptoms, especially if they know they have scoliosis. Um, I generally recommend that patients maybe come in just to have a reassessment. Something may have changed. Um, most of the time not, and most of the time these acute flare-ups can be managed uh, you know, with some 
activity modification uh, and some other uh, simple non-operative measures. But sometimes it does reflect that something has changed. Something is, has, has shifted either actually, physically, or, or just in terms of the uh, relationship of the, of, the, of the body and the scoliosis and, and symptom development. So what is that tipping point? At what point would they be a surgical candidate? It, it's, it's both a complicated and a very simple question. Um, the very simple answer in a patient who's been evaluated, uh, found to have scoliosis, found to be a candidate. So once all of that work is done, um, which is usually an initial visit or sometimes a few visits talking to the patient, it, it really comes down to whether that person, A, has exhausted all the non-surgical options um, for managing their symptoms, and B, has has then reached a point where they say, my quality of life is no longer acceptable this way. Um, and so usually the way that um, my relationship with patients develops is an initial visit or two conversation with uh, education about their x-rays and the implications and the natural history of adult scoliosis, talking just like we have been about activities and lifestyle and so forth. And then usually I don't see them for a while um, because we say, look, as long as you're doing well, as long as your quality of life is acceptable, this isn't something we need to treat. We're not treating x-rays. But if you get to a point where either symptoms come back or more severe, or you, you say, I simply can't continue to, to, to have these kinds of symptoms that are interfering with my function, um, that's the point at which we, we discuss surgery. And what is the surgery for scoliosis? So there's not a single surgery for scoliosis. Um, oftentimes people have heard about spinal fusions, uh, particularly again in the adolescent population where the primary goal in, in most of those patients is to correct, uh, straighten the spine uh, uh, in, in kids. In, in adults, it's all, again, it's about symptom management for the vast majority. There are cases where the deformity itself um, needs to be corrected in order to, to address the patient's symptoms. Um, and we, we have ways of doing that and we do a spinal fusion surgery in those patients. But for the patient who, who only has leg pain, for example, perhaps from a bulging disc or from some stenosis, the first step is to try to find a way to treat that patient's symptoms without addressing the scoliosis, if we can, uh, because that makes it a smaller, simpler surgery. Um, and, and we want to find the smallest operation, uh, if an operation is needed, that has the best chance of helping the patient with their symptoms for the longest period of time. A small operation also it doesn't make sense if, if it's followed in short order by another operation. And so, so it's, um, that's the art as much as the science of, of medicine. Um, and what is the, can you explain what fusion is? You mentioned that a couple of times. Right. So, so fusion, um, as I'm using it, is, is a little bit of a shorthand for, for sort of two parts of the same procedure. So um, in 2018, we, we not only do a fusion, which refers to putting bone graft in uh, a, a, along the spine to help the bones, the individual bones of the spine grow together into a solid block of bone, but it also involves putting in instrumentation which are, are metal implants, most commonly, uh, probably for the last 10 years, bone screws or pedicle screws that go into the vertebrae themselves uh, and then are connected with longitudinal rods. So what it, it serves as an internal brace for the spine while the fusion occurs, fusion being a biological process. The new systems uh, that we have of instrumentation allow us, when appropriate, to correct the scoliosis. So this is the way that when we need to, when it's important um, that we correct the scoliosis, and certainly in every patient it's important if we're doing a fusion to make sure the spine is balanced and well aligned, um, if not perfectly straight. Um, we do that with the instrumentation, then we put in the bone graft, and that helps to hold the spine stable while the bone uh, uh, fuses. Uh, grows together, um, and that's what provides the good long-term outcome. So how do you determine when somebody's scoliosis is going to be corrected by fusion or not? So in again, in the adults, the key is, is their spine balanced? 
In other words, is their head over their pelvis, both when you're looking at them from the front and from the side. We know now that that's essential to the appropriate function and the pain-free function of the spine is balance. Um, and so we look, if they start off balanced and the, the spinal deformity itself is relatively small and the patient doesn't have complaints directly related to the curve, um, then the key there is maintaining the balance. If on the other hand, the, the, the patient is not balanced. Either they have what we call a trunk shift where, where we're looking at them from the front, their head and shoulders are shifted to one side or the other. Or when we look at them from the side, if they're, if they're pushed forward, what we call a sagittal imbalance, which can be part of scoliosis, then it's important that we, that we um, uh, effectively correct those aspects of the deformity. And so it's a, it's a combination of looking at the patient talking to the patient, what are their symptoms, how is their spine affecting their day-to-day -day quality of life, and, and in some ways, least importantly, looking at the x-rays. The x-rays really help us plan the surgery, but they don't tell us what the appropriate surgery is. That comes from the patient um, themselves. I've heard bracing mentioned before. Is that something that you do before, during? What, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I get asked a lot about bracing. I think probably because people are familiar with it from the adolescent uh, population where it's it's one of the frontline uh, non-operative uh, management programs for, for scoliosis. Um, adults are a little bit different. And, and the reason is that in, in children, as Dr. Anderson will talk about, what we're trying to do with a brace is guide the spine's growth until the child is done with their, with their skeletal growth. Adults are done growing. Um, and so, so what we lack in adults is a logical endpoint for bracing. We're not guiding growth. And the problem with braces, while they feel good often temporarily when patients put them on because they help support the spine, they can straighten the curve, um, but what they're actually doing is, is letting the muscles relax. They're taking tension off the muscles. And so it can set up a vicious cycle where the muscles, you know, the patient puts the brace on, feels good. The muscles can relax. They weaken over time. And then a dependence on the brace develops over time. Uh, braces are, can be um, hot. They can be uncomfortable. It can cause skin problems. So, so we try to limit their use. Um, for the most part, I only use braces now in rare circumstances after surgery to help um, to help with patients, first of all, with comfort. A brace can uh, help patients move around a little more comfortably after surgery. Um, and also just to help, uh, there are certain restrictions after, after a fusion operation in terms of movement, and the brace can serve as a reminder of how to, how to move after, after surgery. So what is surgery recovery like for scoliosis? So again, it's going to depend quite a bit on what the individual surgery is, a, a, a microdiscectomy or a, a laminectomy in a patient with scoliosis is not gonna be much different than those surgeries, someone without uh, scoliosis. So those are, are relatively small surgeries, usually a night in the hospital and a few weeks of, of recovery. But for the more, more typical quote unquote scoliosis surgery, the instrumentation and fusion that we were talking about, those are more extensive operations. And whether we do those combined with an open, uh, an all open approach, a combined approach with, with some minimally invasive techniques, um, most of those patients are going to be in the hospital for anywhere from four to six days, typically. Um, we start mobilizing the patient the day of surgery uh, when they come out of the operating room. Um, if not that day, then certainly the next morning we start with physical therapy. Um, but the first few days are, are, are slow in terms of getting up and around, um, but usually a little less than a week in the hospital, occasionally a little bit more depending, um, sometimes to inpatient rehab for a week or two. Uh, the other patients will go home. When I explain to patients, I say the first the first six weeks are the tough ones, sort of like having a newborn. You know, you gotta gotta get through it. Um, and uh, uh, the pain medication makes mobility possible. Uh, we want patients up and out of bed, moving around their home. 
Um, the first corner gets turned around that six-week period, meaning that people start to go out a little bit, um, maybe to visit some friends or have a meal outside of the house. Um, by three months, um, patients are starting to feel significantly better, uh, but there's still some fatigue usually. And sometimes that three to six month period after surgery can be, can be frustrating because while the pain from before surgery has been gone since even in the hospital, there's still the, the lingering, some soreness, stiffness, and some limitations. Um, so it's not a, you know, these operations are not a uh, sort of get a Band-Aid on your back and, and back to work the next day. Uh, it, takes, it takes some time. Uh, will patients have long-term limitations as a result of scoliosis surgery? I imagine it depends on what's being done, but can you talk to that a bit? Sure. I get asked uh, uh, quite a bit about um, you know, how will I be able to bend if I've had a spinal fusion for scoliosis? Uh, how will I be able to move? And I think the, the first thing is for, for most patients, if you were to see them walking down the street, functioning in their day-to-day, -day, you'd be hard-pressed to, to know that they had had a spinal fusion surgery, unless you watch them very carefully. Um, if you watch them perhaps put on their shoes, tie their shoes, or pick something up off the ground, you know, those kinds of movements, you would notice a difference. And the reason, reason for that is that when you fuse the lumbar spine, the, the, the lower part of the spine, which is where most of the adult scoliosis occurs, uh, much less of it in the thoracic uh, uh, spine and, and really not at all in the neck. So it's really the lower spine. Um, when that area is fused, it's no longer mobile. And so the next question is, how am I gonna move? Well, we check pretty carefully to make sure that patient's hips are okay before we would do, uh, first of all, to make sure that's not the source of their problem, but also to make sure that they're gonna be able to use their hips for day-to-day -day function. So a patient who's had a, a scoliosis fusion in their lumbar spine will look as though they have really good posture because they do. They don't bend in their, they can't slump in their chairs. They bend through the hips. When they drop something on the floor, they, they bend down using their, their hips and their knees. Um, and so most patients get back to doing all or virtually all of the activities that they want to do. Um, you know, or we're doing before surgery, although a few things are done a little differently. My patients who are golfers say their swing is a little bit differently, not necessarily worse, not necessarily better, uh, but a different different type of swing, uh, for example. Do you require physical therapy um, following the spinal fusion for scoliosis or any other of your surgeries? I think physical therapy is, is, is critical, um, and there's a couple of different phases to the physical therapy process. So the first is in the hospital. Uh, again, starting off in the evening that we finish surgery or the next morning. And that's simply to help patients learn how to turn over in bed, get up and out of bed, get into a chair without bending their back, without twisting. Um, we say after surgery, no BLTs, and we don't have anything against the sandwich, uh, but it's no bending, no lifting, or no twisting. And those are the restrictions for six to 12 weeks after surgery. So in the hospital and in rehab and then at home in those first six weeks, physical therapy is not so much about strengthening uh, or flexibility or, or endurance, which is often what we think of with physical therapy. It's about body mechanics. How do I move? How do I, how do I get from here to there? Usually then we give patients a little break uh, between six and 12 weeks after surgery because they, they, they still need to recover their body. They need to get their energy stores back. At three months, then the, the second phase starts and that's the more traditional endurance, some core strengthening, uh, uh, individual muscle strengthening, uh, body position, those types of uh, activities and muscles and, and, and skills needed for the long term. And what about other post-surgical therapies, anything else? Uh, it's really the, the key is physical therapy. We often involve also the occupational therapists to help with the day-to-day -day functioning um, for patients, particularly if they have any specific uh, requirements related to their work or any specific hobbies, the, the occupational therapist can be, uh, can be very helpful. And then, of course, when patients first go home, they have visiting nurse uh, and home health aides generally to help out with the transition. You touched on this uh, about getting back to their lifestyle, um, but can you talk a little bit more about when it was quite a debilitating um, scoliosis 
condition and uh, if they can enjoy the lifestyle they had before and what would be the things that would hold them back? After surgery, After what could surgery, hold them back? Yes. So, so again, I think that the, the key to a good outcome after this kind of surgery is, is, of course, me doing my job of the diagnosis, making sure that this is the appropriate treatment for the patient, that their pain is coming from their spine and related in some way to their scoliosis, um, education and expectations on everybody's part. And so um, at the same time, to be quite honest, a spinal fusion operation, it's not it's not a restorative surgery. It's not analogous to a hip replacement that's trying to approximate the anatomy and the function of a, of a native hip. You know, having a fused spine, that's not a natural condition, but in this day and age, it's the best option we have for somebody who otherwise can't function uh, because of pain. And so, so for patients in that situation, the vast majority tell me after surgery uh, with some surprise and sometimes some reluctance because they don't want to jinx anything, how much better their quality of life is without the leg pain, without you know not being able to stand up straight, the, with regaining the height that they'd lost and been able to look family members in the eye. And, and that's, that's a huge benefit for those patients. It does come you know, with the, the cost, if you will, of, of going through the surgery and the recovery. Um, you know, in the longer term, what I hear from patients in terms of limitations, um, you know, I think, first of all, it has to be put in context of what those folks were like before the surgery. Um, but you know, changes in the weather often seem to be associated with people having achy backs after the surgery. That's very common. No one's sure exactly why. Prolonged standing, prolonged walking, meaning more than half an hour, an hour, patients will say they feel fatigued in their back or that feels tight. Sit down for a couple minutes, get up and continue. So, so there's some accommodations that, that many patients make after the surgery, but then when we talk about, well, how does that compare to what you were doing before surgery? It's day and night. Are there any research advancements in the field relating to adult scoliosis and treatment? I think the key, I mean, there's two avenues of research that, that, that we're involved in, or perhaps, perhaps we could, perhaps three. One is the, the, um, the instrumentation, the, the intraoperative techniques and, and tools that we have available. And there's, um, I think probably about 10 years ago or so, there was a quantum leap in, in that. Um, and now we're in a more, a period of more refinement. Um, and that, that makes our job in the operating room easier. It makes it safer for the patient. It makes it, it gives us a better outcome. Um, a, uh, uh, I, th I think that the key, uh, I guess a second, a second area would be biological, helping the fusion process along. That's not something that's guaranteed uh, to happen. It's a process that occurs over, over months to a year or so. And so helping that process occur um, is another area of research. Really, I think that, that the most important and most difficult in some way area of research that we're working on is, is helping to identify the patients who will benefit the most uh, and identify the operation that will help them the most. Uh, and that's very hard because of all of the variables. Everybody's an individual. Uh, every scoliosis is a little different. Every patient's symptoms are a little bit different. And so really what we're trying to do there is look into a crystal ball that doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, you know, and as I tell patients, I say, look, I, I, I'd love to hit a home run every time I step up to bat, but that, that's not the reality. And what you want to pick out are the patients who are going to have that big benefit, you know, uh, such that their life is significantly improved and avoid patients who have a smaller benefit or a patient who has, who's, who's going to have a complication. And so the, the better that we can be about educating patients, understanding patients, understanding why some people do extremely well and some people do less well, um, I think the more that we can help help patients and, and optimize outcomes for treatment of scoliosis. This has been fascinating. We're about to wrap up. Is there anything that you would like to add that I haven't asked you about for your patients or people in the public? No, I think that the, I think that the key is, is with adult scoliosis, which is uh, as, as distinct from 
the scoliosis in the in the younger population and the kids is that this is it's really about the individual and the patient's symptoms it's not a radiographic it's not a treatment based on the radiographic appearance and that the patient in the in the absence which fortunately is very rare but in the absence of profound neurological problems which we rarely see patients in the driver's seat um, and so as i tell virtually everybody i see with this condition i say look i'm not going to sit here and tell you you have to have surgery my job is to to tell you if a i think there's a relationship between what you're feeling and and what what's going on in your spine what the surgery would be um, in my opinion, if, if you were to decide to go down that route, of course, I also need to have a sense of whether I feel that you're somebody who could get through the surgery and would potentially benefit from it. But ultimately, the patient's going to tell me if they need surgery. And that's really the key is that this, you know, that, that for this, for these quality of life uh, conditions, the patient is really, is really the driver. Thank you, Dr. Angevine. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Peter Angevine, come to our website at www.columbiaspine.org and you'll find a lot about him there. Thank you. Thank you.